What's that? <laughs> yeah, I almost tripped there. That's always a fear of mine. <clears throat> well, hey, good morning, everyone. So glad you're here. The great 20th century Catholic spiritual writer Thomas Merton, uh, he wrote an autobiography called The Seven Story Mountain. It's one of the greatest works of the 20th century. And uh, he talks about this conversation, this encounter that he had with the Hindu man from South Asia. And this, this Hindu man uh, had told him that, you know, there, there's lots of Protestant Christian missionaries in South Asia, lots. The odd thing, though, is that they've had minimal impact on Hindu society. And so Thomas Merton, he's kind of reflecting on this. Why did this happen? What's, what's going on here? And he writes this in his autobiography. The Hindus are not looking for us to send them men who will build schools and hospitals, although those things are good and useful in and of themselves, and perhaps very badly needed in India. They want to know if we have any saints to send them. They want to know if we have any saints to send them. And then uh, Pastor Rich Vildas, who I quoted last week as well, um, he pastors in Queens in New York City. He, He talks about this discussion that Thomas Merton and this Hindu have, and then he adds his own side commentary, and he says this, The Hindus in this story were looking for people who can model a different way of being in the world. It's not that work projects don't matter. We need them. What matters more is the quality of lives out of which the work flows. Deeply formed mission is first about who we are becoming before what we are doing. And this line struck me. Our most effective strategy in reaching a world for Christ is grounded in the kind of people we are being formed into. The quality of our presence is our mission. Our most effective strategy in reaching a world for Christ is grounded in the kind of people that we are being formed into. Who are you becoming? Who are you becoming? Put otherwise, does the bridge have any saints to send out in the Chino Valley? That's what I want us to wrestle with this morning. Who are you becoming? Do we have any saints to send out? in the Chino Valley. Um, We are in the second week of this annual fall mission and vision sermon series that we always do. This year, we're calling it Jesus-y. Simply put, we want to be a Jesus-y people. We want to be a church that's with Jesus. This morning, we're going to look at becoming like Him, and then next Sunday, we're going to be looking at actually doing what Jesus did. And uh, if you haven't caught yet, there, there is an order to that that's very intentional and on purpose. Uh, last week, we talked about we, we have to be with Jesus. You, you, you got to spend time with Him. And, and then this morning, once you're with Him, you end up kind of naturally becoming like Him, with the goal being then that you actually go out and do what Jesus did. And so this morning, we are all after becoming like Jesus. Hence the question, who are you becoming? Do we have any saints to send out in the Chino Valley? Now, my guess is when you hear the word saint, you probably think, ooh, well, that's not me, Mark. Um, Do you know what I did yesterday? (laughs) And no, I I don't know what you did yesterday. Um, But here's the thing. In the Scriptures... The word saint doesn't mean a perfect person. In in the Bible, saint, a saint is someone who's actually imperfect, someone who's flawed, someone who's messed up, broken, and jacked up. 
The story, the, the story of the Bible is only about messed up people, and then check this out, who God sets aside, and their purpose becomes living for God. That is what a saint is. So when I use the word saint, anybody who claims to be a follower of Jesus, you are a saint. We, this is the saint's house right here. I'm not talking the football team either, all right? <laughs> but we are imperfect people. A saint doesn't mean that you're perfect. Um, you don't need to be Mother Teresa, all that kind of stuff, although, of course, she was a saint as well. But people who follow Jesus are saints, and Jesus has already cleansed you. I mean, that's what He did on the cross. You don't have to try to be good. In His eyes, you are already perfect because of what Jesus has done. So, saints... We need to start calling each other saints, all right? It's a little old-fashioned, but I like it. With that in mind, let's turn to the book of Romans. So, uh, much of the New Testament is actually written by this guy named the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul, he, he writes all these letters to different churches in the ancient Mediterranean world. And what's actually interesting, and this is stuff that we usually skip over, but in the beginning of many of these letters, Paul actually, he, he addresses the people he's writing to as saints. He calls them saints. And so Romans is, is one of them. In, in Romans 1, he calls the church of Rome, he says, he addresses them as saints. Now, let's go to chapter 8. <clears throat> uh, if you need a Bible, page 772 and the free orange ones underneath your chair. So Romans 8, 28, this may be a uh, a very familiar verse to many of us. Romans 8, 28, here's what the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Rome, these saints. And we know <clears throat> that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who've been called according to His purpose. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Now, Romans 8.28 is one of the most common like Bible verses in America today. Uh, it, it, it's what I call like bumper sticker Bible verses. And, and what I mean by that is you see Romans 8.28 you know, like on a bumper sticker on a car. Uh, maybe you, you see it on a shirt or like in a, a card that you give someone. Um, you see it on Facebook and Instagram posts all that kind of stuff, and, and that's great. Uh, the problem, though, with many of those posts is that they leave out two really important contextual aspects surrounding Romans 8, 28. We focus on verse 28, but I think for the Apostle Paul, I think verse 29 is the point, and I would argue the purpose, the backbone, the climax for verse 28. So let me, let me reread verse 29. Paul says, for those God foreknew, He also predestined, and here it is, to be conformed to the image of His Son. We don't talk about that part. We don't talk about verse 29. We talk about verse 28 because it gives us all the warm and fuzzies, which is fine. Second thing, a lot of us, and you're probably thinking it right now, Oh, is he going to be talking about predestination this morning? And if you've grown up in the church, kind of in the theology world, that's, that's a bit of a, there's kind of two different sides to that discussion. And, and the second kind of bone to pick that I have with the way people interpret this usually is that they focus all on the word predestination here, and they get up and they get caught up in that conversation, and they leave off the whole purpose of verse 29. Whatever you think of predestination... Paul's point is that human beings are to be conformed to the image of his son, the son being Jesus. So the point is, humans are to be made, they're to look like Jesus. We are to be conformed to his. When people look at you, do they see Jesus? When you look in a mirror, does your reflection Jesus? To be a human fully alive is actually to look like Jesus. You and I, saints, we were made to be like Jesus. Jesus was the most 
brilliant, lived the most fulfilling human life ever. He was the most human one, if you will. Now, if that sounds kind of like a little abstract or whatever, let me um, now quote from the message, which is a modern day paraphrase to kind of put this more in 21st century language. Here's how they translate this. God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of his son. The son stands first in the line of humanity he restored, and here it is, we see the original and intended shape of our lives there in him. In Jesus, you become who you were made to be. You find your purpose, you find your lifestyle, who you want to look like, your role model, if you will, it's Jesus of Nazareth. We are to be conformed to the image of His Son, and God decided that even before the world was created. Now, let me give you one more example, also outlined in the Scriptures, because let's, let's make sure this isn't just kind of a one-time thing. Um, so, another letter that Paul writes, he writes to the church at Rome. He also sends, actually, a couple letters to the church in Corinth. And if you're still caught up on this saint topic, let me tell you something about the church of Corinth. Corinth, in the ancient world, was like their version of Las Vegas. It was a booming city, and there was a lot of sin going on, <laughs> all right? What happened in Corinth stayed in Corinth. Well, actually, it didn't because Paul talks about it, but you get the point. So, point being, Paul's not talking to a perfect community. But once again, in 1 Corinthians 1, Paul addresses this community as saints, to the saints in Corinth. And then we read this, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. There's two letters. So the second one, chapter 3, verse 18, here's what Paul tells these imperfect saints. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who's the Spirit. So there it is again, second time, very, very clear, almost identical language to Romans 8, 29. We, you are being transformed. You are, you are being shaped and formed to turn into the image of Jesus, to, to look like Him, to reflect Him. Now, let me give you 21st century modern lingo of that from the message. Nothing between us and God, our faces shining with the brightness of His face. And so, we are transfigured much like the Messiah. I love this. May this be our prayer this morning. Our lives gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become like Him. See, the image that Paul's using here is he's saying metaphorically, it's like you gaze, you, you contemplate, you, you stare, you, you encounter, you take in the beauty of Jesus' life. And in fact, you stare at Him so much and you're glazing at Him so much you, that you end up spending time with Him and then you end up becoming like Him. Your face reflects His glory the brightness of His face, our, li our lives gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become like Him. Again, the question stands, who are you becoming? Are you becoming more like Jesus or more like someone or something else? Now, here's the issue. In our culture today, in our educational system today, we value, we preach, if you will, on how to climb the career ladder. We teach, we proclaim how to become smarter. We teach, we proclaim, we preach on how to achieve more. But I'm not sure if we really dive much into how to have a good 
character. David Brooks, he's written a landmark book called The Road to Character. He writes this, most of us have clearer strategies for how to achieve career success than we do for how to develop a profound character. See, the issue is without building a strong character, your achievements, however great they may be, will eventually fall to pieces. Your achievements will not sustain you for life without a strong, robust character. He continues, you won't even achieve enduring external success unless you build a solid moral core. If you don't have some inner integrity, eventually your Watergate, your scandal, your betrayal will happen. See, what you do ultimately in the long term may not happen in the short term, but in the long term, it depends on who you are. And I would argue, I think we are just seeing screaming examples of this over and over. It almost seems like weekly the news of this in our culture right now. We have uplifted people who have very long developed resumes, but very small, low character. Check this out. We praise success without character. We prize gifting over character platforms and and notoriety, but small character that can't maintain that big platform. And check this out. I think Christians, the church, here's one for you. We prize and want the Holy Spirit's giftings of power, I think, often more than we want the fruit of the Spirit. But usually the way God works, He doesn't give you His power unless you first have a solid moral character that can uphold and handle that power correctly. Now, go even deeper. I mean, there's so, it seems like every week that I go on Twitter for me, there's another story of another lead pastor who's exposed and has to resign because of some type of toxic leadership, money laundering, uh, narcissistic bullying, whatever, an affair. This happens, folks, and it's not just in the church. You see this in politicians on both sides of the aisle. We see it in professional athletes. I think about the story of Tiger Woods years and years ago, or even Deshaun Watson now. You see it in CEOs. You see it in celebrities. Culturally, We have focused way more on what we're getting and what we're doing and what we're achieving than who we are becoming. And the results have been destructive. See, actually what I think our culture wants and needs more than ever before is actually, and this is so simple, but people of deep character. People who are, and I'm going to do this one, who are Jesus-y. People who are human beings that are fully alive. People that when you look at them, you're tempted to ask, man, that person looks like Jesus. Do you know that if you're a follower of Christ, your job is just to become who you already are in Christ? The invitation is to take a bit of the future you and to bring it into the present. Jesus is far more interested in who you're becoming than what you do or where you're going. And that's because who you're becoming will shape and dictate what you achieve and where you're going. We flip-flop them, though. Now, I could just stop right there, call it a day, point made, all right, we need to be shaped into the image of Jesus, that's what we should do, we're to look like Him, Get it, we're done, we can call it a day. I think the point is made. Yes, thank you. The truth of the matter is, I would be doing you a disservice if I just stopped there. Because, yes, the point is to become like Jesus, but you have to understand the context of how do we become like Jesus? 
See, we love to quote Romans 8, 28. Oh yeah, God works all things out for the good of those who love him. And that's absolutely true. But do we know the context of Romans 8? Do we know the context of 2 Corinthians? Let me give it to you. Romans 8 and 2 Corinthians, and actually probably most places in the Bible where it talks about becoming like Jesus, they're all surrounded by a context, and this is what's going to hurt, but suffering, affliction, hardship, and difficulty. So check this out. If you open up your Bible right now to Romans 8, like the orange Bibles that we have, now this isn't in the original manuscripts, but the translators do this. Literally the subtitle of Romans 8, the subtitle, I'll read it for you, it says present suffering and future glory. Present suffering. Uh, the, 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 The metaphor that Paul uses is a lady in childbirth. Now, I've seen childbirth twice. As he says right there, there's a lot of groaning. There's a lot of difficulty. There's a lot of hardship. It's not fun. No, literally, there's physical pain. And Paul uses that metaphor. He says, actually, guys, girls, this is what life is like right now. That's the context of Romans 8.28. All right. What about 2 Corinthians? It gets better or worse if you think about it. The whole theme of 2 Corinthians, Paul writes the whole letter in the context of him facing affliction and despair and suffering and hardship. I mean, it's not kind of your typical, you know, hallmark charming letter. Oh, let's dig in a little bit. 2 Corinthians 4. So, I read for you 2 Corinthians 3.18, literally, literally the next chapter, all right, chapter 4. Here's a little taste of Paul's life. 2 Corinthians 4, starting at verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not us. And here it is. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that His life may also be revealed in our immortal body. So then, Death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Saints, you ever feel hard-pressed? Do you ever feel crushed? Do you ever feel broken? Do you ever feel demoralized? Do you ever feel struck down? You know what that's called? The hard knocks of life. Might it be that Jesus does His greatest work in you and through you during the hard knocks of life? Could it be that your character, your image, is most refined when it's in the furnace? See, I don't think our culture, I think we really struggle as a modern culture to deal with suffering and pain and affliction. What do I mean? Um, I think people, they, they, they freak out when bad things happen to them. Like, uh, like we're, we're almost shocked by it. We, we, we run away from pain. We want nothing to do with it. We don't know how to handle it in the midst of a storm. And I think that's because our culture story to assign meaning and purpose to suffering. See, if there's no God, which is secular culture, if, there's God, if there is no God and, and there's no objective meaning or purpose, then there's no objective meaning or purpose to your suffering or whatever tension and conflict that you encounter in your life. There's no, there's no purpose. It just, just like how you were created, it's just a, a molecular accident. Some atoms happen to hit the right way, and in your sense, didn't hit the right way. It's an accident. There, there's no meaning and purpose to your suffering if there is no God. And in the end, there's no justice. There's no final putting things to right. Well, 
boom. Boom, you came in, boom, you go out. Or, okay, well, okay may, maybe God, maybe there is a God, maybe He's kind of like, uh, you know, the giant moral police upstairs with a long gray beard. And maybe every time that you experience something bad in life, maybe He's kind of, so to speak, like whipping you uh, because He's punishing you for something. You've done something wrong, and so now He's going he's gonna to give you a little hardship. Maybe that's why you're suffering. Yeah, it's kind of like karma uh, in, in, a, in a Buddhist worldview. Well, you know, if you do something bad, then sometimes somewhere later something bad will happen to you. Or what if in the story of God, suffering is God's gymnasium to help you become more like Him? What if suffering is God's gymnasium to help you become more like Him? Um, Tim Keller, I think in my mind, probably the greatest book on this topic, Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering, Tim Keller writes this, Christianity teaches that contra fatalism, suffering is overwhelming. Some of you need to hear that, suffering is overwhelming. Contra Buddhism, suffering is real. It's not an illusion, it's real. Contra karma, suffering is often unfair. But contra secularism, suffering is meaningful. There is a purpose to it, and if faced rightly, it can drive us like a nail deep into the love of God and into more stability and spiritual power than you can imagine. And then he's just warming up. Check this out. He writes, the gym exposes deficiencies in our body's strength and stamina and appearance. This one made me hurt a little bit. You can wear all kinds of daytime clothes that hide or minimize aspects of your body that you would like to be less visible to the eye. We all like to do that. But in the gym, you cannot hide them. There you and your coach and unfortunately everyone around you can see where you bulge where you shouldn't. It's okay to laugh, folks. It's an incentive to get to work. And so this metaphor tells us that when life is going along just fine, the flaws in our character can be masked and hidden from others and from ourselves. But when troubles and difficulties hit, ah, we are suddenly in God's gymnasium. We are exposed. Our inner anxieties, our hair-trigger temper, our unrealistic regard of our own talents, our tendency to lie or shade the truth, our lack of self-discipline, all of these things come out. Woo! I I don't know, maybe it's just me and Doug feeling that one. Me and you, all right, dude. I got some stuff that I don't like to bulge out. Spiritually speaking. Some of you. This doesn't mean, and I need to be clear on this, it's very serious. This doesn't mean that God causes your suffering all the time. Because some of us in here are going through some incredibly tough times right now. And what you need to hear is that, as his quote says there, man, suffering is unfair. And of course, there are times, I mean, there are consequences to our actions, right? So, uh, I mean, if you go steal something from a, a store and the video camera caught you, and the police arrest you, and you go to jail, yeah, you're going to experience some suffering, and that's on you, right? I'm not talking about those instances. But the truth of the matter is, we live in a very painful, tough, broken, marred, distorted world. We live every day in the hard knocks of life. And our invitation as Jesus followers is, okay, God, man, I'm in a storm right now. But how are you inviting me to find meaning and purpose in this suffering to become more like you? Only a Christian can ask that. Only a Christian can find meaning and purpose in their difficulties. If you don't believe in God, it's just an accident, there's no meaning. If you happen to fall within kind of an Eastern worldview, they actually say suffering is an illusion, it's not real. See, your character will last into eternity. You know that? 
who you're becoming, I mean, that, that goes on forever. Like, it, it doesn't end. I saw this great Instagram post uh, about a couple weeks ago. This is Billy Graham quote, and I mean, you can never go wrong with a Billy Graham quote. He says this, when wealth is lost, nothing is lost. When health is lost, something is lost. When character is lost, all is lost. I don't think there's a better way to parse this out practically than honestly a real life story. I could have tried to think of some example or something like that and then I thought of something better. I thought of someone in our own church who's actually been in a season of difficulty, of hardship, of suffering, and they got beautifully shaped into the image of Jesus in the midst of it. So I want to invite up um, Irene Martin. If we can give Irene an applause as she comes up. Um, If you don't know Irene, well, if you don't know Irene, you should. She's awesome. Uh, Irene is, she's on our board. She's a deacon. She's our treasurer for this year. We love, love her deeply. And um, as I was working on my sermon and I told her this, her just, her story immediately came to me. And so um, she kindly accepted uh, me putting her on the spot up here just to ask her a couple questions um, because I think Irene's life, and particularly this season, is the sermon. So Irene, could you share with everyone, um, and maybe this will even be like therapeutic for you, (laughs) all the difficulty, all the hardship, all the annoyances and frustrations that you've gone through um, in this season. That way they just kind of understand and capture what's been going on. Well, I don't know if I can tell you all of it, but I will hit the highlights. Um, I have a 93-year-old mother who, oh, I'm not on, sorry. Oh, there okay. you go. I have a 93-year-old mother who um, has dementia, and she also has um, arthritis, bone-on-bone arthritis, and she's unable to walk, and so she's in a wheelchair. And she's always told us, the kids, that she wanted to stay at home, die at home, and we tried to honor her and got her 24-7 care at home. So if any of you have any idea about care at home, it's extremely expensive. And um, it came to a point last year around this time Um, I told my brother we only have maybe eight months to ten months left of money. We need to do something and do something fast. So that's one. 2022 was my goal, and I emphasize mine, to retire. I wanted to retire this year. So last August, I asked the Human Resources Office to start estimating my retirement um, income And in the meantime, they learned that um, my request to increase my life insurance that I submitted 30 years ago was processed, but the system didn't take it. And they tried to tell me that I owe 30 years worth of premiums. The first bill I got was $5,900, and that was for a 12-month period. So multiply that by 29, and those of you who might be calculating it, it was $171,000. It was probably less than that, but still, I figured it would be somewhere between 140, 150. And so that came up, and one month later, I went in for my checkup, um, And they told me that my blood sugar level was sky high, my triglycerides were sky high, so they started working on me, and they were keeping a close eye. In January, I went back, and they said, well, your numbers came back down, but your liver is being attacked now. And I was, I was like, I I was falling apart. I was absolutely emotionally falling apart to the point where I would wake up in the middle of the night gasping because of the stress that I was going through. And so in, in the midst of all those crazy things, 
you've told me that you reached the point about a month or so ago that something happened. And so could you share with everyone in the midst of this large, deep pit that you're in, what did God do to you? How how did he shape you? How did he form you? What, What did he do in you in the midst of this dark pit? Well, a few months ago, actually, it it started to occur a few months ago. We had an altar call up here, and a member came up and touched my back and started to whisper in my ear and gave me God's word and told me that God loves me, that he knows everything I'm going through, that what I cannot take care of, he will. And that day... I left the church, and I was sitting in my car getting ready to go home, just thinking about the the word that I was given, and I was so happy. I was so happy I started to cry, and I think I ran straight to you, Mark. I don't know if you remember. I'm sitting in my car, and suddenly I felt just completely wrapped in love Mm. to the point where it wasn't just my inside, but it was my skin. I could feel feel everything just it was the most incredible feeling and between the word and that love that I was feeling and by the way I was so convinced it was God I hung on to that and in my prayer I kept saying that I know he was going to take care of everything I know he was going to do it and months passed and nothing was happening anywhere so about a month ago, well, two months ago, about May-ish, I guess, I was in prayer asking for the same thing over and over. Please take care of this. I want to retire. I, I want, I could better take care of myself. I could better take care of my mother if I retire. Please just make this bill go away. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, it is not his will. And I was so deeply hurt. And I was defiant. I said, what do you mean it's not his will? (laughs) And I, um, it took me a bit, but I finally accepted that it was his will. And I surrendered. And I said, it's yours, God. Take me wherever it is that you want. You don't want me to retire. Then where am I supposed to be? And then suddenly, to make a long story short, uh, several um, opportunities came up. I ended up leaving an office that I opened 21 years ago and made it very successful. I thought I was going to be retiring from that office. By the way, I work for the federal government, and, you know, there are offices everywhere. Uh, So I didn't... And FYI, Irene's a big deal. A what? You're a big deal. Oh. No. Um, So I ended up in Los Angeles. Who would go to L.A., right? But the deal was, okay, well, you can work more than half of the week at home and telework. Oh, okay, I can do that. And it was temporary, 120 days. All right, I'll I'll do that. I I can still stay close to home. I can go to my doctor. It'll it'll work out. So then by my second week, end of the first week, they were saying, you did apply for the job. And I said, no, I'm just here temporarily no, you need to apply for the job. So two weeks later, I'm being told the job is yours. And I said, I wasn't interviewed. (laughs) And they said, no, the local leaders, they know they want you. And I said, at that level, at the level that we were talking about, even Washington, D.C. gets um, involved. They interview the selectee. Well, not the selectee, the person that's being considered. Absolutely. Headquarters did not interview me. I said, but I haven't been interviewed with headquarters. And they said, we know. They don't need to interview you. They concur with the selection. And I sensed this peace, this incredible peace. And I felt like I needed to be here. So I decided, okay, I'm going to accept the job. And God, if this is not your will, you need to close the door very quickly. And he didn't. In fact, he just kept opening it and opening it. And he told me, well, then I was told, I have a ceremony that I need to attend to that we're naturalizing 2,100 people tomorrow, by the way. 
at Dodger Stadium. And I said, oh, okay. And they said, you're the MC. <laughs> it was incredible. My mother, she is in a care facility now. She loves it. It's, it's a residential home um, with only five or six people in there. And it, she's getting really good care. Um, her home is in escrow at this point, giving us financial um, security to care for my mom in the future. Then about 10 days ago, I received a letter from Department of Homeland Security saying that my request, I submitted a request for a waiver for that $171,000 that I didn't hear for over a year. And I received a letter saying that your request for waiver has been approved in its entirety. As Irene and I were, as I was just listening to her, uh, processing this with her, um, I just find it so beautiful and powerful that the Lord took her to that posture of surrender, and she had to get there first. And she, so she encountered his love, his peace, and joy, and those just happened to be the first three of the fruit of the Spirit. What an amazing work. And then he was just so kind to just redeem the whole thing. I mean, just what a beautiful story. All I had to do was accept his will. And I surrendered, and he rained blessings. By the way, the joy that Mark is talking about is the joy that I am having in my new job. I haven't experienced this type of excitement in years. I have a great boss, and I'm loving what I'm doing. Thank you, Irene. Oh, Doug, you are a saint. That's a saint in action right there. Doug Dawson, come on, baby. So in light of Irene's story, the question is, who are you becoming? Are you becoming more like Jesus, even in the hard knocks of life? A huge financial bill, a mother to take care of, wanting to retire, health issues, and maybe you're kind of like, okay, <clears throat> what does this practically look like, Mark? Um, and we just alluded to it. Is I just want to take us real quick, and, and here's what we're going to end on. Um, Galatians 5. Galatians 5.22. Um, this is a passage, it's well known, it's, it's, it's called the fruit of the Spirit. And I think what Galatians 5.22 is, is this. It's a character description of what it looks like to become like Jesus. You could actually plug in Jesus for each of these character traits. So here, here's the list. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, is joy, peace, forbearance, that's patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Here's what I would encourage you to do this week. Ask yourself, do I have this fruit in my life? Do I have love in my life? Do I have joy in my life? Do I have peace in my life? Do I have patience in my life? And let me, let me be clear on one thing. It, you can't just force yourself to have these things. It's not like, oh, okay, Mar, my, I want to become more patient. Okay, 
I'm going to become more patient. You will fail doing it that way. I've tried. <laughs> Especially with patience. My wife can tell you that. The, the metaphor that Paul uses here is, is one of fruit. You know, can grapes on a vine, can a grape just try really, really, really hard? oh, I just want to become, I had a glass of this last night, I just really want to become a petite Syrah. Oh, I, I want to try so hard, I want to be petite Syrah. No, it's ludicrous. How, does, how do grapes become amazing petite Syrah? By staying connected to their vine. So it is with Jesus. It's really good. If we want to become like Jesus, We just got to stay connected with him. If you want to become like Jesus, be with Jesus. That's what Paul means when he says there at the very end, walk in the Spirit, or keep in step with the Spirit. Just walk with the Holy Spirit. Go his road, go his path, and you'll see this free organically start to bud. Here's what I want to end with. I'm going to use patience as an example because I struggle with it. And I want you to do this for all of this list in Galatians 5. Ask yourself for each one, but we'll use patience as an example. This is a great quote from Mike Pilvachi. Uh, we had Mike here a couple months ago. He writes this in his fantastic little book, Wasteland. <laughs> I like this. Instead of asking for an instant parking space, how about asking for the Lord to grow in you the fruit of patience? so that others might see more of Christ's likeness displayed. And then we can apply this to everything. Think about it. Will people flock to a God who who provides parking spaces or to a God who demonstrably changes lives? Will people flock to a God filled with people who just get their every little thing at every little moment and have peachy lives? Or will people flock to a God who has sons and daughters in the hard knocks of life who are becoming beautiful pictures of Him? I think we know which one. Let me invite up the worship team. We're going to go into a time of ministry now. We'll have the prayer team come up. If you're new here, we we love prayer um, because we believe that prayer changes lives. Like we we believe that the creator God is alive and he is in the business of making your life more like Jesus, no matter what the situation. And I love that at the end of Galatians 5, Paul says, just keep in step with the Spirit. Walk with the Spirit. It's not, we, we can't force this to happen ourselves. We can't manipulate God. But we wait on God. We stay connected with Him, and then He does amazing things. And so I want us just to wait on the Lord. You can stand. You can sit. Put your palms out. There's nothing magical to that. But what is powerful is a surrendered life to God. The best place to be is in a life that's just surrendered to God. That's, that's the best place. That's, that's where He does His work. So Holy Spirit, You are here. May we become aware of Your presence. Holy Spirit, may You Convict us, encourage us, give us hope. Shower us with your love, your joy, your peace, your patience, your kindness, your goodness, your self-control. May we be a people that the Chino Valley flocks to you, God, because they see how broken we are, but how good you are to us. Now come minister to us. Come, Holy Spirit. 
Come, Holy Spirit. Amen.